and welcome all of you to the February uh, Lunch and Learn program. Uh, today, um, uh, the title of our uh, presenters, or I should say our presenter's title is What is Liberal Education and What Does It Matter? Um, and with us today is our speaker, uh, Dr. Georgia Nugent. Uh, Dr. Nugent joined uh, IWU as the interim president in August of 2019 and was named to the official role uh, by the Board of Trustees on November 14th, 2019. She's the 20th president of the university and the first woman to serve as university president. A widely published scholar of the classics and of higher education, Dr. Dr. Nugent earned a bachelor's degree from Princeton University and a doctorate from Cornell University. Before beginning a dec decades long presidency at Kenyon College, uh, Dr. Nugent served uh, at Princeton as assistant to the president, associate provost, and dean of the Center uh, for Teaching and Learning, and as professor of classics at uh, both Princeton and Brown universities. She also taught the classics, um, or uh, excuse me, were on the classics faculty at Cornell, as well as uh, Swarthmore College and Kenyon College. Dr. Nugent later served as interim president at the College of Worcester and is currently a senior fellow at the Council of Independent Colleges. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Nugent, uh, President Nugent, to um, our Lunch and Learn program this morning. Thank you, Dr. Carl. Dr. Nugent. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, and I appreciate, it looks like uh, 21 folks have joined us. So thank you for, uh, for coming to the Lunch and Learn. I think uh, Carl and I began uh, talking about the, my doing a Lunch and Learn last year. And mm -hmm. I was very excited with that idea and wanted to come down <laughs> to the museum and do that. And then we all know what happened. COVID happened. So, so here we are at last, uh, each of us in our own space, but uh, I will hope that uh, someday, perhaps in the future, we will do another Lunch and Learn actually in the museum. <clears throat> so uh, my title for these remarks is, what is liberal arts and why does it matter? And I'm going to focus on uh, three things, I think. One, the very, literally the meaning of liberal arts, about which there is a lot of misunderstanding. Uh, a bit of the history of liberal arts education, and particularly in American higher education, where it is frankly unique. So I'll, I'll say a bit about that. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, try to address the question of why does it matter? And as the president of a liberal arts institution, as Carl said, now for the third time, uh, I am very often in the, in the position of needing to clarify why liberal arts matters and why it is so important. And so that's the note uh, on which I will leave. But first of all, we start right off with a problem. And the problem is the very term liberal arts. There is tremendous misunderstanding about what that actually means. So let me say right off the bat, liberal arts has nothing to do with your political beliefs, nor is it actually associated with the fine arts. So I think we often, I remember actually, I was, uh, I was in my presidency at Kenyon and we had a number of Chinese students that I was meeting with as, as they were entering the college in, in orientation. And I remember one of them said, well, wait a minute, I'm conservative. So I don't think I should be in a liberal arts school. Well, liberal does not have to do with your political beliefs. Uh, the term liberal arts derives from Latin where it is artes liberales and liber is the word for free, a free person as opposed to a slave. So that's the essential, the original meaning of, of liberal. And the arts doesn't mean painting or dancing. Ours in Latin is more like a skill or a technique. You know, it's not uncommon for someone to say about anything, fly fishing or what have you, 
it's more an art than a science, right? You've heard that phrase, it's more an art than a science. Well, that doesn't mean that it's a fine arts topic. It means that there's a technique or a skill uh, that is an art. So liberal arts actually means the skills or the abilities that are appropriate to a free person. Now, this term, and I, I guess I hope I'll circle around at the end to say why that in fact is the reason that liberal arts is important in a way, it matters. Um, this term liberal arts was picked up by the founding fathers of this country in part because they were very well versed in Roman history. And if you look back to our founding documents, the Federalist Papers and other things, you will see that very self-consciously, the American founders felt that what they were doing was they were refounding a republic like the Roman Republic. And they read Roman authors extensively. You may be familiar with Jefferson's quote that he could more likely do without food than be without his books. He was extremely well-versed in both Greek and Latin authors, as were most of the founders of the country. So as they thought about founding this new republic uh, on the American shores, they naturally turned to the ideals of the Romans. And one of those ideals was study of the liberal arts. Now, in American higher education, this has taken a particular for form that is frankly different from just about any other place in the world. Um, if you attend a British university or a European university or a university in Asia, typically when you enter that university, you are entering on a particular professional path. Uh, in Europe, for example, uh, studying for law begins as an undergraduate degree. You know from the time that you're a first year student or a freshman, you're training for law and that's your path. Uh, or you're training to be a chemist or a mechanical engineer or whatever it is. American education developed differently. Here, we do not tend to narrow to a particular profession or a walk of life until later in the educational process. And this idea that your original higher education would be liberal arts, that is, would be all kinds of study, all kinds of topics that are appropriate for a free person to equip that person with a wide variety of skills and types of knowledge and arts, if you will. So, that is something that distinguishes American higher education, as I said, from virtually any other university uh, practice in the world. Now, it happens, for example, I serve on a number of university boards, and one of them is the American University of Sharjah. Sharjah is one of the United Arab Emirates right next to Dubai. So all around the world, there are, in fact, American universities of a uh, very famous one, the American University of Beirut or the American University of Cairo and so forth. So our model has been picked up occasionally and introduced into another culture, but the native higher ed education culture tends to be one that is channeling a student early on in their adult life. As I said, we don't do that here for the most part. Certainly that's not what liberal arts colleges and universities do. And it's worth noting that there are many uh, surveys and studies and reports about higher education all across the world that are published today. And some of them are rankings, uh, very significant rankings of the world's greatest universities. In all of those rankings, it is American colleges and universities that occupy the top slots. So this model, which is particular to us, where we have a wide variety of studies, also turns out to be recognized as one of the most effective modes of educating individuals. Um, 
So what is liberal arts then? Uh, if I say that, you know, we have this very successful model of liberal arts education, what is liberal arts education? Well, here too, there is often a misunderstanding. So, uh, and, and you encounter it very frequently today where people often think that liberal arts means exactly what fields you're going to study. So most people would say liberal arts is things like English and humanities and perhaps religion, uh, maybe putting an art, a fine art in there. Those things are liberal arts. Some people would say, oh, but studying biology or chemistry or physics, that's science, that's not liberal arts. Well, in fact, from the very beginning, from antiquity, the sciences have always been considered a part of the liberal arts. They're a part of that, those techniques, that equipment for fully living. And so they are part of the liberal arts. But in addition to that, we now typically think of liberal arts as being not exactly a particular set of subjects or a particular set of courses, but more appropriately, it's a way of approaching study. So I would, in a, in a shorthand sort of way, I would say that liberal arts is about asking questions more than it's about learning answers. And I distinguish those in this way. Um, let me try to think of an example. Uh, if I study, well, let's say, Let's take chemistry. If I'm studying chemistry in a liberal arts type environment and a liberal arts mode of instruction, then typically I'm going to be asking, why does that happen? I see that this reaction occurs, but how can I understand what, what, uh, what causes it? What lies beneath it? What else can be done in that regard? It's a questioning of what are the principles? What are the, the deeper understandings? If I were to study chemistry in a, in a non-liberal arts way, it might be that what I'd be learning is the recipes for perform performing certain experiments. You know, take so much of this chemical and add that much of the other chemical and poof, it's gonna turn purple. Or, or it's going to explode, as many chemistry kits do. Um, the liberal arts training is not just, it's not training you to follow a certain set of instructions or recipes. It's training you to ask deeper questions. And that can happen across virtually any field. Um, I was challenged once by a student to say, well, if you were studying um, uh, air conditioning repair, how could that possibly be taught in a liberal arts manner? And I thought about it for a minute and I said, well, you could study the history of air conditioning. For example, Nero and the other Romans would have snow carried down from the Alps during the summers so that they could have air conditioning, right? <laughs> you, can, you can study a field in all of its sort of roundness, its history, its philosophy, its uh, the ways that, that psychology has affected it. That's what liberal arts is about. It's about a, a, a more complete uh, investigation of a topic rather than simply learning a technique. Now, the other thing about liberal arts is it's often believed that it has been the same since time immemorial. So when those original colonists, those founding fathers and mothers uh, introduced liberal arts to America, what they studied then is that's exactly what liberal arts colleges teach today. That is false. There would have been a time not too long ago, for example, uh, we could look back in the catalogs of Illinois Wesleyan and some other older, slightly older universities, and you probably would not find an English department because English was not a part of liberal arts learning. Uh, that came later. Why would you study English? It's your own language, right? So the, the curriculum of liberal arts continually evolves. For example, just recently here on the Illinois Wesleyan campus, we have introduced neuroscience. Obviously, neuroscience wasn't being studied in 1850 when the college began. Uh, we study now sometimes languages that would not have been a part of the early curriculum. We have introduced recently here the study of entrepreneurship 
in a liberal arts sort of way, not a recipe book, but thinking more deeply about what is entrepreneurship? How does it exist in the world? What are its ethical dimensions? What are its psychological dimensions and so forth? So the liberal arts curriculum not only is not fixed once and forever, but it is continually evolving. And it evolves to meet the changing needs of the world in which we find ourselves. Now, uh, another point along those lines that I just want to mention, going back to the early days, is uh, there's also a sense, and this has been very widespread, that if you're studying liberal arts, ipso facto, by its very knowledge, that means you're, you're studying something useless. Some people would even say that's the virtue. You're not studying just a craft, you're studying something useless. That was never the case. The, the liberal arts were always meant to be useful to the student, to the, to the person being educated. And a good way of illustrating that is that when the original colleges were founded in America, I think of Harvard, William and Mary, Yale, Princeton, our earliest universities or colleges, they were, as I mentioned earlier, that distinctive liberal arts model, but they were actually professional schools. The reason why the curriculum of Harvard or Yale was Latin and Greek and Hebrew was not because they were esoteric, useless studies. It was because the students in those universities were training to be preachers, to be pastors, and the tools they needed were the languages to read the scriptures. So in a sense, there has always been a useful, professional aspect to the liberal arts. And it's a misconception to think that what they're actually about is studying things that will have no direct use in the world. The opposite is the case. And so I'll go back there, I think, to the, the question of uh, what is the use of the liberal arts? Why do they matter? Why does liberal arts study matter? And I'll reiterate what I just said a moment ago about American universities being the most admired universities in the world. In fact, one of the United States' largest imports is students from other countries because they want to come and study in our universities. And why is that? Well, in part, American wealth probably contributes to it. We have outstanding facilities and libraries and capabilities that one might not find uh, in another place, but a large part of why American universities are so successful and so attractive to others around the world is the way in which we foster innovation. And liberal arts is one of the very best ways to foster innovation. Why? Because you are you are educating people, not only, as I said earlier, to have a set of answers about this is the way you go about fixing the air conditioner or, or even arguing the law case. Um, if you're in law, by the time you narrow your field of study, for example, to the study of law, in some ways you are learning a very prescribed set of procedures and processes. Liberal arts is different from that. It's urging you to study anthropology to understand how societies work. Again, psychology to understand how people interact with one another. The arts to, to enter into the life of, of someone else, a different kind of life than you've ever known. Um, sociology to understand other societies. Yes, the natural sciences to understand the world in which we live. All of those contribute to the liberal arts learners toolkit if you will. And it's because liberally trained uh, individuals have that ability to cross disciplines, to bring in historical context, that they are able to be innovative in a unique way. I don't know whether any of you might have seen a number of years ago, there was a, a documentary film called The Fog of War. And it was, um, oh goodness, I'm going to forget. Uh, the person who was the Secretary of State at the time of the Vietnam War. That's terrible. I've just forgotten the name. But uh, he was, it was kind of a debriefing of what he felt had happened during that period and, and why we had been wrongheaded in what we did. 
And I'll never forget, he said, if we had understood the history of the region, if we had understood the people and their sociology, we would not have acted as we did. And we see that over and over, that in order to truly bring a, a thoughtful, innovative, successful approach to an issue or a problem, you need to have that ability to view it from many perspectives, through many different lenses, and that's exactly what liberal arts gives a student, gives a learner. And that's why I believe it's actually far from being useless. Uh, in my view, liberal arts is the most practical education you could possibly have because it gives you the tools to be successful in any number of endeavors. Moreover, it's more practical than ever today because we know that the world is changing faster all the time. So if I'm a student who goes to a technical school to study electrical engineering and, or let's say computer science, and what I learn is how to put together a certain uh, you know, motherboard, and that's what I know. Well, once that product changes, my knowledge is gonna be absolute and obsolete. I'm going to have to retrain because I only know this set of things. If you're a liberal arts learner, part of what you are learning is to be a learner, to be constantly open to new kinds of information, to bring to bear those different array, that different array of studies that you've had. And that's what enables liberally, art, liberally educated folks to typically be extremely successful. Uh, if you look at the Fortune 50 or the Fortune 100 corporations, or you look at leaders in other areas in this country, a surprising number of them were educated in liberal arts. Uh, a few years ago, the uh, director of the National Institutes of Health was an English major. Uh, uh, Meg Whitman, well known for her various uh, uh, business and political successes, studied uh, medieval literature. So you find that people who studied topics that were not directly oriented toward a particular job actually turn out to be a able to succeed in any number of jobs. And as I said, that we know is a skill that is ever more valuable. We know that our graduates today from Illinois Wesleyan will not have three different jobs or five different jobs, they will likely have five careers during the course of their lives. And most of those have probably not even been invented. So the more liberally educated they are, the more tools in their toolkit, if you will, the more successful they're going to be, the more innovative leaders we're going to have in our country. And that is why liberal arts really matters. Thank you. Now, Carl, do we have questions? Yeah, thank you, Georgia. Um, we actually do have some questions. Uh, and if you do have questions, if you could put them into the uh, Q&A function uh, of the um, uh, um, Zoom call. Uh, John has a couple of questions. His first one is, uh, and I'm assuming the it is liberal arts. If liberal arts is so important, uh, should it not be taught in secondary rather than tertiary education? Uh, yes, hold on. Sorry, I was just typing something. Well, in fact, I suppose this would be in a, in a way another distinction. In fact, we typically do that at the secondary level, right? Now, again, I would distinguish that from many European universities where you begin on your career training actually already even at the secondary stage. But here, if we think about students in high school, uh, our typical pattern is you're changing into different classes throughout the day, right? Maybe you go to your science class, you has, have some phys ed, maybe you're studying a language, you almost certainly have an English class. Mm -hmm. So in fact, we do that at the secondary level here pretty broadly. Okay, um, one other question, does, very good, does the very good liberal arts colleges contribute to the poor results in many high schools? I think I don't understand the question, Carl. I'm sorry. 
Okay. Well, um, John asked, uh, does the very good liberal arts colleges contribute um, to the poor results in many high schools? So John, um, if you could clarify perhaps uh, what you mean uh, by that, um, if you could put that into the, um, uh, the chat uh, or the, uh, I should say the Q&A function and perhaps uh, we can um, ask an additional question down the road. Uh, the other question though that has, well, go ahead. Um, is, uh, uh, does IW have general education courses that are targeted for certain degrees? We, we do have a part of our curriculum is what we call general education. And often those are the courses that often students tend to take them in the first years of their course of study here, but they may take them at any point during their four years. Um, they are not targeted for a particular uh, field. In fact, that's their very point in a way that the general education courses are general. They are the place in which we most concentrate on providing that broad array of fields of study and modes of learning. So that is definitely a part of our curriculum and a part of most liberal arts curriculum. curricula. Um, the typical pattern, as many of you will recall, though it's not universal, uh, is for students to typically spend their first two years at university, often doing a large number of general education courses, dabbling in different fields, so that they identify what interests they most want to pursue. And then in the second two years, often to narrow a bit into those majors, as they're usually called. Uh, those are not absolute, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, ideally, students will be partaking of both throughout the field that they think will be their more specialized field and a range of areas that are, are uh, different and broad. Um, one of the places where I have taught is Brown University. And Brown has a very, what they call the open curriculum. And they do not organize that way. Students can can uh, complete their education in whatever manner they choose. So occasionally I would have a student who came in and knew absolutely he or she wanted to be a computer scientist. So that's all they took in the first two years. But then because Brown is a liberal arts college, they were going to take those general education courses later in their career, in their junior and senior years. So the, the typical pattern is a, a, a kind of a funnel, right? beginning in your first year with a broad array of general education and gradually narrowing somewhat to a particular field in which you major. Okay. Um, Sally has a question. Could some liberal arts areas of study be disguised uh, in quotes with the names that do not sound like liberal arts, i.e. cognitive science? Oh yeah. <laughs> Actually, one of my favorite faculty members here uh, teaches finance and says, you know, whenever I teach finance, I'm teaching liberal arts. I'm teaching writing. I'm teaching aspects of psychology. Why do people make the financial choices that they do and so forth? So that's kind of what I meant um, in saying earlier that liberal arts is often more of a way of approaching a subject than it is a particular subject matter. Absolutely. And we we actually foster that and encourage that here. Again, uh, you would find typically that our science faculty are not only teaching science, they're very conscious of trying to teach writing at the same time, or trying to place the science historically in how it has evolved over the years. So absolutely, those disguised titles are there. Okay, um, a follow-up I believe from John, and it goes back to the question of, um, uh, the relationship between um, liberal arts colleges and uh, perhaps some of the poor results that we're seeing in high school um, in high schools these days. Um, I think the implication here is uh, perhaps some of the um, uh, individuals who are studying education uh, in colleges uh, aren't quite getting the same quality uh, of instruction that they should be. Hmm. Okay, I'm just pondering. That. <laughs> uh, so I guess the implication would be that if 
education majors were more narrowly focused, they would be more successful as teachers. Possibly, I'm, yes. I'm guessing here. Uh, I myself would not hold that view for the reasons that, um, that I spoke about earlier, that I think the broader your understandings of the world, uh, the more you have to offer as a teacher as well as, as an employee. Um, but I, I guess, I, well, I guess I would go further and get myself into hot water by saying, I think that um, we have seen that education programs, which are very narrowly focused on technique, uh, rather than a broader sense of human understanding and learning, tend to produce teachers who are not as successful in exciting their students about the possibilities of learning. Um, I'll use an analogy. Uh, we are in a very bad situation, I think, in this country uh, now, in that we have far too much of teaching to the test, which is kind of the epitome of what I mentioned earlier about looking just for the answer rather than thinking about the question. So teachers who are being compelled to simply teach to the test so that the student will memorize the right answer are, we are finding, I think through a lot of research, that they are not inciting a spark in young people to encourage them to explore the world in a deeper way. Um, a question from Deborah: Have uh, the liberal arts evolved not only in what is taught, but how it's taught? Oh, absolutely. Yes. And a lot of that has happened actually just within the last few decades. So for many, many years, uh, the, the teaching in, at the college and university level was more rote. Uh, there, were, there would be a lecturer and students would take notes on that lecture and then be tested on those notes. Now, that still could be a broad, uh, a broad topic that was being considered, but the pedagogy, and you will see this if you go into the archives of a university, uh, as Meg Miner would attest to, uh, it's very clear that, that students attended the lectures and they had to take notes on the lectures and they had to uh, then, to some extent, regurgitate those notes. Um, in more recent decades, we have learned a lot more through the cognitive sciences and studied how it is that people actually do learn. And one of the things that that teaches us is that we don't learn by being told things. Uh, contrary to the fact that we all, you know, we all engage in lectures like this, right? But we know now that actually listening to someone telling you something does not internalize learning. In order to learn, you really need to be able to undertake the thing itself. And that's why more and more, in certainly at Illinois Wesleyan and across the country, we're seeing more of what's called experiential learning, where the student learns by doing, by having some kind of experience, whether it's um, actually even doing an internship in some field or carrying out research in some field. So there's much more engagement now on the part of the student, uh, not as a passive listener to the expert telling them something, but for a student to be able to have the opportunity to try something themselves. I will tell you an interesting um, factoid that was new to me, I must admit, and I was the Dean of the Teaching and Learning Center at Princeton. Uh, so I had thought a lot about teaching, but uh, it was, we had not, yet I think come to some of these understandings about learning. <clears throat> in order for someone to learn something, they also often have to unlearn what they thought they already knew. And I'll give you an example in my own field. Uh, I am a classicist. I study ancient Greece and Rome. And if you think about, let's say ancient Greece or Rome, and you conjure up their art, I know what you will think of you will think of a lovely white marble statue, right? And we see them in the Louvre, we see them in the Met, all Greek and Roman art is these beautiful white marble bodies. That is not what Roman and Greek art was. In fact, it was garishly painted in bright colors. 
It just happens that all of that paint over the centuries and centuries has worn off. But it's almost impossible to have a student realize what it would be like for you know, a famous Greek statue to be bright red and yellow and blue. You can't grasp it because you've already internalized this view that all of ancient sculpture is white. So, so before you can actually introduce a new understanding, you have to recognize what people already think they know and address it directly, or else it will always push out the new learning. Carl, you're muted. Thank you, Candace. I'm sorry. Um, uh, from Michael, uh, in your opinion, which model of general education serves students more effectively? Oh, I assume you mean which of the ones that I mentioned where you mm -hmm. would tend to concentrate on general education in the beginning or save it to the end? You know, my, as I think I, I kind of alluded to, my preferred view would be to have both things kind of going simultaneously because I think that um, with certainly the way in which we teach in America, where the typical, well, not so much anymore, but traditionally the typical college student is 18 to 22 years old, let's say, that is such a formative period, such a developmental period, that if you encounter, uh, you know, Homer, you encounter the Iliad when you're 18, and you encounter it when you're 22, you actually have very different levels of understanding and it means different things to you. If you ever have a favorite book that you reread over and over again, you know that as your life changes, the book changes and what you're able to grasp from it changes. So I'm not entirely keen on saying, oh, okay, cram all of, that, all of those broad-based courses into the very beginning. And by the time you're more advanced in your studies, concentrate on only one thing. I think that's actually not ideal, even though it's often what, what does happen. Okay. Uh, John clarified, he said, uh, our colleges are very good, but many of the high schools are not. Uh, I've heard uh, faculty say that students will learn proficiency in English in college. Um, uh, there is AP honors courses for the talented 10th grade, uh, leaving the rest with some standard education. Um, the college educated may forget that grocery store clerks um, uh, are more essential um, than them at times, so. Well, that's, I, I'll take that in, in one direction. I do think that, um, I think it's really regrettable that there tends to be very little uh, um, partnership, collaboration between the K through 12 system and the 12 through 16 system of college and university. Ideally, or not ideally, I mean, in fact, those are a continuum. If you are a college going student, it's a one to 16 uh, course of study. And yet there is a, a, often a, a very bright line between high school teachers and college teachers. Whereas in reality, they should be much more in partnership. I've thought about this a lot in my own, um, in my own career because uh, many, many colleges have some kind of small outreach program to the schools, but typically it's very uncoordinated. There is not a set of best practices. There is not a national kind of standard for how you do that. And so if anything, there's often, unfortunately, um, very unfortunately, almost a sort of hostility sometimes between the, the secondary system and the tertiary system. You know, it, it's not that unusual to have a college faculty member say, well, you know, they should have been taught better in high school. Well, we should all be collaborating so that it's a, it's a seamless system of progressive, um, progressive learning. And that does not happen here as much as, as I wish it did. Great. Well, thank you, Georgia. I, I just wanted to uh, uh, say uh, that uh, we thank you for all of your comments today and such, and I'll turn it back over to Jeff uh, for closing remarks. Jeff? 
Again, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Georgia, and thank you, Carl and Candace. Candace Summer is our uh, Director of uh, Education. She's our tech person today, bringing you our seventh lunch and learn of the season. And uh, I know this is probably a conversation for another time, uh, Georgia, but that last statement, you may have me thinking about Common Core and, and how that plays out from you know, 1 to 16. Uh, so um, yeah, but anyway, uh, thanks everybody for coming. And uh, the next Lunch and Learn, I'll uh, put the uh, link up in the chat. And yeah, I mean, I, I really appreciate how you kind of simplified the whole, uh, the whole topic and, and why uh, studying something useless is, is, is just a false assumption, right? It's useful. <laughs> yeah, it's useful. And um, uh, it's, you know, it's the way we foster uh, innovation. I remember that. I took notes on that. And that's a good segue because uh, next month on March 11th, uh, the Bloomington Normal Innovation Alliance is partnering with our uh, digital future with Jamie uh, Matthey, uh, City Council, and uh, Kevin McCarthy, uh, Town of Normal Council. And again, uh, the uh, registration link is in the chat, and uh, we bid you all a good day. If there's anything else, again, we thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.